John Stewart, Palsis, there you are, John. There you go, with a lovely uh, Aurora background. Oh, have I said that right? There we go. Yeah, it's uh, Aurora Borealis. Yeah, I'm getting into that sort of yeah. background. I'm talking about bats, so I thought I would. Um, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, drive, drive, driving your batty. Normally, it's what I do for people, but um, I will. Uh, yeah, let you let you talk about bats, isn't it today? Fantastic. Okay, I'll just share my screen with you. Let's have a look. Everybody see that okay? Um, I've got your, oh, there we go. Yep, perfect. Fantastic. Okay. Um, excellent. So, yeah, um, yeah, we're talking about non-target species and, you know, how we, how we want to protect them in our day-to-day uh, -day business when we're going about doing pest control. So bats are obviously our... Uh, um, big bone of contention. We we come into contact with them, um, given the, the the nature of the areas that we go into, lofts and and cellar spaces and things like that. So we will come across them inevitably uh, during the course of our work, and we've got to be quite careful um, when we do come across them. So hopefully today I'll be able to give you some guidance on um, what to do and what not to do and what to look out for. So yeah. So we're going to talk about what are bats, um, the benefits of bats, because they are beneficial um, to us as pest controllers and the wider population, um, how bats find our food and evidence of bats. So when you're going about doing your job, the things to look out for um, that will be sort of key indicators as to whether or not there's bats present. Um, what types of bats are commonly found within buildings as well? And where in the building can, bat, uh, can bats roost? So it's important um, to, to understand whereabouts these, um, these small mammals may be actually hiding within a building. And danger to bats, you know, uh, posed by ourselves, but I'll talk about other dangers as well and the legal protection which they have, which is uh, important. So um, bats belong to the, the order uh, Chiroptera, which means uh, hand wing so the membranes basically uh, for their wings are anchored to their their fingers effectively which enables them to fly they're the only true flying mammal so unlike um, flying squirrels that glide um, bats can actually fly from a, a sort of standing position and maintain flight whereas flying squirrels would just glide to the ground they're warm-blooded um, like all other mammals they have fur and um, they feed their young on on milk, so they will will raise their young and and bring bring them up and feed them on on milk. They have one baby per year, and um, they can have uh, a delayed implantation, which is similar to pine martens as well. So they will the, the egg will become um, inseminated um, and during the uh, autumn months, and they won't give birth till sort of late spring and then they'll rear their young. So they will delay that across the winter period to ensure that when the, the young are born, there's um, plenty of uh, insects for them to feed on uh, to maintain that, um, that their, uh, the, to maintain that energy levels and to be able to supply uh, milk to their young. Some species will live up to 30 years as well. So that's quite long lived, depending on, on, on the species that they are. There's over 1,400 species of bats in the world, so they make up one-fifth of all mammal species. And in the UK, it's a quarter. So one in four mammals in the UK is actually um, a bat. And there's 14 breeding, uh, breeding uh, species uh, in the UK, and there's four of them that are on the, the red list as well. So um, we've got to be quite careful with them. They can fly at about 60 miles an hour, and um, they are very, very um, beneficial to man in that they will catch lots of insects. The oldest bat recorded was um, 52 million years, and uh, it's found 52 million years uh, ago, and it was um, found in the bottom of a, a, a lake in uh, Wyoming in, um, in America. So it shows that they have been around for a, a long time. And in terms of evolutionary adaptation, they haven't changed very much. Um, their facial features, their nose, their ears, 
and that their feeding habits um, have, have changed. So they've adapted to feed on several different uh, things, like for instance, there's one that feeds on, black, uh, on blood, we've all heard of uh, vampire bats, and there's fruit bats as well that will feed it on, on fruit as well. But the ones in the UK, um, they all feed it on insects, so they're, they're insectivores. Traditionally, they're in, uh, divided into two main groups, so the mega tripturin, um, the mega bats, sometimes called fruit bats or flying foxes, these are found in sort of the tropics and um, they're, they're quite large. Their wingspan is probably about um, the size of me, five foot seven, and they can weigh up to one and a half kilograms. So they're, they're quite, um, quite sizable um, mammals. And the, the microchiptera uh, or micro bats, um, these are the ones that are found in the UK. Those are, um, those are a lot smaller. And um, the smallest one found um, on the planet is a bumblebee bat, which roughly weighs about the size of a small penny and they're just over an inch in size. Um, they do form other functions, like for instance, um, spreading uh, seeds to um, encourage the growth of um, fruiting plants. When they defecate, the seeds will come out and it'll encourage um, the growth of different plants, but some others will um, also cross uh, pollinate plants as well. So they do have a, a benefit in, in sort of ecosystems. And they're nature's pest controllers, so um, they will keep large numbers of insects down. Said before, all UK bats feed on, on insects. Uh, one bat can eat over a thousand insects per night. In fact, um, the pipistrelle bat will consume about 3,000 uh, midges per, per night and uh, mosquitoes, so they do a good job. Um, they help, um, our bats are considered to be one of our bioindicators as well. So if you've got uh, lots of bats present, then it means you've got a healthy ecosystem because there'll be lots of insects there as well. Um, how do bats find their food? Well, they use echolocation. They're, they're not completely blind. Um, they will be able to distinguish light and, and dark, um, but they they use um, high frequency um, uh, sonar um, pulses or noises that they will emit in order to detect their, their prey. And they can even distinguish the size of the prey and what type of insect it is. Certain bats will feed on certain moth species and they can tell exactly what that is by the flight pattern and, and size of them as well. Uh, bats are, all, uh, are often found uh, using buildings to roost, um, somewhere to sleep and raise a young. Uh, particularly um, as their natural roosting sites have become uh, a lot scarcer. So, for instance, uh, due to deforestation um, and um, development of, of housing, they've cut a lot of trees down, which has made um, their natural habitat a lot scarcer. So they're now using uh, buildings as well. We find them in old churches too. So bats, they can use um, all areas of sorry, all areas of a building. However, they're most commonly found in walls, eaves, and, and roofs. And unlike rodents um, and, and birds, they do, not, they do not build a nest and they don't cause any structural damage to a building. So having them within the building is not going to cause any, any issue to the actual structure. Um, the type of evidence that you'll come across is smearing on walls where the bats are continuously using this to get in and out of a, a, a roost area. Um, like rodents, they will leave smear marks. So they have sebaceous glands. They will pick up dust from their environment and then transfer that onto surfaces. If it's a white surface, it will be a, a lot easier to see. And sometimes when they're flying into these areas as well, you will end up with um, bat droppings uh, stuck to the walls or um, in and around um, window ledges. And if your car's sat directly underneath it, that will get covered in bat droppings as well. So whenever we're going to uh, do any sort of treatments, we'll be um, sticking our head into to the loft most probably. And if you come across um, evidence like this, where you've got large piles of guano, um, this is directly underneath the ingress point where they're coming in. You've got smearing all down the pipe lagging. And when you go stick your head up into the loft, uh, you'll get this um, quite nasty whiff of, uh, of ammonia that's coming from the, the feces and, and, and urine. 
When they're hanging upside down in rows as well, you'll get um, lines of uh, guano that form where the, just below where they're actually roosting as well. And I'm sure everybody knows about the, um, the crumble test. Um, so in terms of their droppings, this is the droppings here at the top left, and they're not very uniform. You can see that they, they look quite rough. And when you pick them up between the thumb and forefinger, I would do this on a piece of tissue wearing gloves. Um, it will crumble very easily um, with very little resistance. And if you stick it under a microscope like I did here, you'll see that there's lots of uh, wing fragments and uh, fragments of insect exoskeleton. And if you shine a torch on it, it will um, it'll slightly um, it'll look iridescent as well because of the chitin from the, ins the insects will um, reflect the light. Um, unlike mouse droppings, which are relatively uniform in size, but they're quite... Um, quite difficult to actually break with your fingers. In fact, they, they shouldn't. And um, they look smoother as well in appearance. Other evidence you would look for is um, live bats. That's an obvious one. So if you stick your head above the hatch and there's uh, bats flying around, or you can see them uh, gripping onto structures such as under timbers or on breeze blocks, then you'll know that there's, there's bats present. Um, I would look right down into the eaves and into the, the sort of areas where the soffit boards are on the inside because they will congregate there as well. So it's important to have a good look around and not to disturb them. Uh, as that's another important factor. In terms of um, the bats that are most commonly found in buildings, it would be your pipistrelle bats. Those are the most common ones in the UK and the brown long-eared bat as well. In terms of where they'll be found in a building, well, it's almost anywhere. So barge boards um, up at the sides of the buildings, under the eaves, under soffits and fascias, in and around the lead, um, the, the lead uh, fittings on, on the roof as well, around the chimney, um, under windows, between the actual window frames and under, under the window sills. Um, you name it, um, they can get into sort of uh, small cracks and crevices. So if you're ever doing any treatments, uh, and ensure that you're checking these places before you go and actually uh, put any insecticide or anything down. And in terms of, um, of danger to bats, um, the most common one probably is uh, glue boards. Um, if they're put up in a, a loft area when you're doing a rodent control treatment and the area hasn't properly been investigated for the presence of bats, they may uh, inadvertently fall onto a glue board, become trapped, and then potentially starve to death. Um, so if there's uh, if there's any evidence of bats up there, you know, I wouldn't be putting glue boards in a loft area. Um, a lot of homeowners, when they have a cluster fly infestation, they'll hang up fly paper. This also will capture bats too and uh, cause them to suffer as, you know, they won't be going up to check and they may not have the knowledge to check for, for the presence of bats as well. So bats will um, inevitably die as a result of people hanging uh, these fly papers up. Also open traps. So if you've got snap traps up there, um, to control rodents. If they do land on it, they might be heavy enough to actually spring it and um, cause them to be um, accidentally killed as well. So again, check the loft area, put um, put traps in enclosed um, boxes to prevent um, them falling onto it. Uh, fly killers, so fly killers in lofts, um, they will emit a high uh, high pitch frequency and uh, noise that can't be detected by ourselves, and that can also disturb bats as well um, and it may cause them to you know uh, fly into it or, or disturb them so it's not wise to have these uh, hanging in a loft space as well um, especially where there's, there's bats present it's, uh, uh, it'll pose a fire risk too Insecticidal treatments to sort of wood uh, for wood boring insects. So if you're doing anything for um, say powder post beetle or um, or woodworm, then any insecticide which is painted onto the timbers, even uh, fungicidal treatments that are being used for timber remediation could cause uh, bats to die as well. They will come into contact with the um, with the insecticide and absorb it through the through their skins. 
this is uh, one of the, the things that I always tell technicians to do. If you're treating a wasp's nest, always go into the loft and um, check internally for the presence of bats and also open water tanks as well. Um, you don't want to be treating a, a, an ingress point where you can see wasps are going in and out and not checking the, the actual loft itself. You may pump insecticidal dust into that loft space and uh, wipe out a, a whole load of bats, a, a colony of bats. So yeah, check, um, check the loft space before you do any wasp treatments. And fogging treatments for flying insects, so for cluster flies. So if you're using something like a, um, a handheld fogger or a pyrotechnic um, sort of fogging, um, uh, fogging applicator, then go, go up and check first and ensure there's no bats because inevitably if you're going to fill that whole area with insecticide, that will kill bats as well. Doing rodent treatments, so if you're putting um, anticoagulant contact preparations around the site, if there's um, bats present and they do pick it up on the skin, uh, they do have a closed circulatory system, just like a rodent, so they will hemorrhage internally. When they groom themselves, they will ingest the anticoagulant, pick it up on their body and um, die as a result of it. So again, check loft areas, be careful where you're applying um, uh, contact preparations. Other dangers to bats would be um, things like netting systems or, or proofing to try and prevent um, ingress of birds. Uh, you may uh, inadvertently uh, block uh, ingress and egress into a bat, uh, bat roost. This is a, a job that was done and they had to actually consult um, the bat protection uh, people and they suggested putting up these wooden boards. This would allow the bats to clamber up and then into the roost, but prevent the birds getting in. So you weren't uh, denying any access or causing any sort of interference with their roosts. So there's, there is ways of, of overcoming things. So it's worth consulting them. In terms of uh, legal protection, um, bats are endangered um, or threatened. So both the UK and Europe uh, will give them full protection. Uh, protection. It's illegal to intentionally kill, injure or take any bat or recklessly damage, destroy or block up their roosts or disturb them because bats tend to return to the same uh, roost year in, year out. Uh, these sites are protected whether there's bats present or not, um, that the roost is protected as well. So that's something to bear in mind. And it's a criminal offence to deliberately capture, injure or kill a bat. Uh, intentionally or recklessly disturb a bat in its roost or deliberately disturb a group of bats. Damage or destroy bat roosting place, even if they're not occupied, I said that before. Possess or, or advertise or sell or exchange a bat, dead or alive, uh, or intentionally or recklessly obstruct uh, a bat roost. And it works out at £5,000 for every bat that you, you kill. So if you, you know, look at a typical roost, it can add up to quite a, a sizable uh, fine. And you can also get uh, pr uh, imprisoned as well for, for destroying them. And there is people that you can contact. So the, the law doesn't prevent um, pest control occurring within a property where bats roost. Um, you, what you've got to do is um, contact uh, the you know, the, the correct uh, people, so statutory uh, nature conservation organisations um, for your country, so um, Natural England, um, Northern Ireland, it's the Northern Ireland en Environment Agency, Scottish Natural Heritage and Natural Resources Wales. If you contact any of them with regards to any concerns you have about doing pest control within an area that you know there is bats, then they could advise you on how best to go about this. Um, they may actually suggest that a bat survey is done before any any sort of treatment uh, commences. And also, if you go on to the uh, Bat Conservation Trust website, there's lots of information there as well. You can contact that contact them by email or you can phone them. And of course, uh, the BPCA has lots of good material there as well on um, on their website. Uh, lots of helpful numbers and advice to. And if you require any information, you can also contact myself as well. And that's it for me.
great. Fabulous, John. Appreciate that. Um, we've got a good got a good 20 minutes if we need it for some questions. Um, we've got three that have popped up. So are there specific qualifications for being able to carry out bat surveys that you, you know of? Yes, there there is. If you contact the Bat Conservation Trust, they they can um they can put you onto various courses where you can uh, become um a bat ecologist or you can do these courses to be able to do surveys. Yeah. Great. Is it quite is it expensive? Do you know? Just out of interest, most people would be thinking that. I'm not too sure. I would join one of the um sort of local bat groups first, and then I would um I, I would progress to doing that once you've got a bit of um. I don't know, a bit of experience under your belt. Yeah, no, absolutely. Most important thing. Um, do you know how long, like with surveys, when you get someone out, because I talk about it a lot, but people on tobacco conservation, et cetera. But I don't know, do you ever know how long it takes for them to get out to a site? Does it vary? Resources, things like that? It varies, yeah, on, on resources. And, and I suppose it depends on um, how quick the need is it, you know, it, to be done. Obviously, if there's a gaping hole in somebody's roof and there's water pouring into the house, they may come in quicker to do the survey to try and get remedial action taken to sort of block block holes up, yeah. Yeah, right, okay. Um, so George here says, is bat guano categorised under a specific waste code regarding removal and disposal? Uh, that I don't know. I've never, I've never actually had any jobs to remove it. Sorry, my voice going. Uh, we, we, we have um, say a lot of questions coming in about uh, think, for instance, guano. It can be bird droppings generally as well. I think I actually looked up the term what guano means the other day. Like that's, that's my life. Um, and yeah, it, it does include uh, seabirds a lot of the time, also bats and things like that. But I think general, general term. And with um, like pigeon droppings, allocating a waste code to it is actually pretty tricky because there isn't anything in the European waste codes that says, you know, bird droppings or bat droppings or, or rat droppings or whatever droppings they might be. Um, and so it is tricky actually getting a code, George, just sort of kind of answering a little bit. But when it comes to waste, it is actually your responsibility to decide which code to allocate. So I would say go through the European Waste Code list and have a ponder yourself which one. Um, I think it's under the category 16. So it's normally six six digits, like pesticides is 201119 and um, other things. But guano, I think it's category 16 rather than 20. So just have a look in that list. You might find something you want to allocate it as. Failing that as well, whoever you're using as your waste contractor, ask them, you know, they're the experts in, in waste management. So a lot of the time they'll go, oh, yeah, we'll allocate it this code. Um, so, so yeah, it doesn't answer it directly as a code, but it is a tricky one. To, um, exactly. So it's an agricultural code as well for like, you know, dead carcasses or, you know, um, something to do with the... Um, say feces of some description to do with farming and agriculture but again it's not particularly specific enough it's strange it's a difficult one once it's been treated with a biocide as well it may be considered to be inert as well you know because you've killed all the pathogens that are within it so it may be that it's you know it can be just disposed of yeah yeah it depends on the waste company right. they always like to add a few few zeros at the end of it <laughs> yeah they not not in most categories of waste as well they normally have like a miscellaneous code um, like there's one under the pesticide side of things there's a, a miscellaneous code so sometimes they're appropriate to use um but yeah it's uh yeah enjoy that anyway looking through the waste codes <laughs> yeah, definitely uh so barbara says i think someone told me that the bats are most likely to stay in places for about places about three meters hang on i think someone told me that bats are most likely to stay in places about three meters is that true oh okay so having a their their roost being three meters kind of wide. I think that's what Barbara's getting at. Sorry if that's not right. Oh, three meters. Oh, the yes, so she's corrected herself. So I think someone told me that bats are most likely to stay in places about three meters high. Is that true? Yeah, you'll get them uh, high up in the loft area, but you also get them uh, down in the actual um, eaves, down in the soffits as well. So you get them in gathering in there as well. So you've got to have a look everywhere in that loft area yeah and they could be actually within the cavity wall as well where pipes are protruding through so there might be evidence of droppings in there but they might be living uh predominantly in the wall cavity so you've got to be like, really careful 
You've got to be careful, yeah. It's always that's the thing. It's the questions you've got to ask ask the the, the, the occupiers when you get there. Like, do you, are you aware of any of that activity at all at any point? And if they say absolutely not, you know, you can maybe take that as you know, you do your inspection as well. But um, and then that could possibly be okay. But if there's any mention, I think of well, it might have been once. That's when you need to really you know look into it, don't you? Yeah. Yeah. Um, are bats active this time of year in in attics and lofts? No, they're in hibernation at this moment in time. Yeah, they should be waking up round about maybe uh, March time, uh, yeah. February March time, and then they'll start start being um, more more evident. Yeah. Hmm. Do you think bats are affected um, like insects are? But at the moment, where I live, the ladybirds like it in my place. <laughs> they're, they're all up in the windows, in the cracks, and in the corners, and things. But lately. They've been getting a bit confused. They've been waking up and flying around and bashing into things. And I've seen queen wasps as well come out. I was in the gym the other day when I flew down. Everyone freaked out. Um, do you think well, will bats get a bit, you know, with the temperatures? Because we're so it's so random at the moment. It can be 12 degrees one day and then, you know, minus one the next. Um, can you, they be affected, you know, with them being vertebrates? Yeah, yeah they, they, they can. In fact, they actually do wake up out of hibernation. They've done studies where they've used thermal imaging cameras and they've actually um, seen the, the, the bats that's turning their, basically their body clock back on and starting to emerge from hibernation to drink and then they'll go back to sleep again. So they, they do that. I, I suppose if there is a change in our weather patterns, it's going to affect insects, light and temperature, then it will have an effect on them as well, which could be detrimental, especially if they wake up, up out of hibernation and there's not enough insects there to sustain them. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's crazy. I've done a talk the other day on, on climate change and how that affects pest control. And it's just, uh, yeah, it's an interesting subject. I think in my lifetime, it won't be like a massive change, but I think, yeah, it's definitely something uh, we're all noticing a little bit, things being a little bit earlier, aren't they? And uh, things like that. Um, anyway, enough me babbling. Oh my God, we've got a good 13 minutes left. Uh, we've got some more questions coming in. It's great. Uh, Edward, is there a way to identify if bat droppings are fresh? Um, I've seen droppings before, but never bats present. They tend to dry up pretty quickly um, in the environment because they are made up of insect exoskeletons, so they will crumble pretty pretty quickly. It's difficult to ascertain how fresh they are. Um, someone else had just asked about um, health risks associated with them. Yeah, you can end up with um, similar diseases being transmitted um, that are in uh, bird feces, things like um, uh, cryptococcus and things like that, histoplasmosis that could be within the actual guano itself. So um, if you're ever in an area where you know that they're present, uh, wear P3 filter masks to prevent you uh, breathing in any sort of uh, pathogens. Mm -hmm. Great, yeah, that would be great, yeah, great advice. Maybe a lot of people might not have thought about doing that, and actually, yeah, that's a very good point. You know, make sure you you protect yourself, even when you know you're dealing with with looking for bats. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, so Christopher says, is, is it the pest controller's duty to report the bat problem, or is it the homeowner's duty? It's the homeowner's duty. Yeah, I would um, I, I would ask them to contact the the bat conservation people and. Um, yeah, I, I would allow them to, to to look after that. Otherwise, you can get tied up, um, you know, in in this. So, yeah. yeah. Sorry, I just bashed my desk then and my camera went all a bit late. <laughs> we turned it back on. <laughs> Don't use a lot of these things. Um, yes, uh, great. So, do bats hibernate in lofts or in colder areas such as hollow trees? The it depends on the species. Um, Different species have got different kind of niches. Some will like to um, actually hibernate in caves, others in sort of uh, hollows of trees, and others within loft spaces. Like I said, the pipistrelle and the brown long ear, those are the ones that you're most likely to come across in loft spaces, although other bat species will use them, but yeah. Yeah, great. So like you said, it depends on the species. I suppose with yeah. any pest we're dealing with, depending on the, the species where they're going to, they're going to live. Um, do the bat, do any bats in the UK predate on Asian hornets? Interesting question. Um, probably not. Asian hornets will probably be inside during the the night when the bats are more active. Um, those are well, bats are nocturnal, um, whereas the hornets will probably be within their nest. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good point. That's that's yeah, because that's why they they feed on things like you know mosquitoes and you know uh, things like that. Yeah, moths, large yeah. moths and things like that. Also lace wings as well. So they do provide uh, um, a good source of pest control for horticultural pests as well. So they will kill uh, pests that are detrimental to plants. Mm -hmm. 
yeah. yeah. Great. So yeah, good pest controllers, like you say. Uh, everything has its benefit and uh, in in the world, don't they? Um, to a degree, apart from humans, probably. Yeah, we'll probably have the least benefit. Um, Chris asks, any ideas how much a bat survey costs for a typical domestic property? It can vary depending on who's doing it and yeah, the size of the the, the prop, you know, the size of the property. Um, I've heard various figures being bandied around things like um two grand and things like that but i'm not i'm not sure yeah yeah i wasn't sure whether like bat conservation if they do it um if it's you know a domestic property do they do it for free sometimes because it's beneficial to their study or would it is it always going to be chargeable i don't know well, again not, I'd, not, I'd sure. Have not sure about that no no interesting one to maybe try and find out and get some feedback on if anybody on here has experienced any surveys from back conservation or or or, or anywhere else an ecologist or whatever and you've got an idea of that and stick it in the chat section and um, um share, share the info just to say that uh, local back groups and back conservation do sometimes do the initial surveys uh, just to check what's there but if you were going to do any changes to the in environment in that loft space, then most likely they would recommend that you've got a an actual um, consultancy, an ecological consultant to do a proper survey and assessment. But you could certainly get the advice free to start off with. Oh, great. So you've got loft conversions and things like that. Yeah, you'd have to have them. In. Yeah. Great. Right. Thank you, Darren. Appreciate that. Um, so we've still got some time left here. We've still got so eight minutes left. So Philip, are you noticing any adverse effects on bats with regards to increased insulation for air source heating? And can home, yeah. No. Yeah. I, haven't, I don't know if we would... Uh, was that um, air source heating? Don't know if I know what that is. I don't know. Should I know what that is? <laughs> um, and then, uh, extra to that, Ahmed has said, can homeowners remove bats on their uh, on their own cost? No. No. Yeah. I think on their own accord, no, nah, you can't touch them. No, that's it, absolutely. Definitely not. not. Um, just a reminder on that legislation that they're protected under, just for the benefit of, of that question. Wildlife and Countryside Act, 1981. Um, I wasn't testing you there. I was just, yeah, I just thought, yeah, <laughs> it's not the Natalie show. Uh, Ian, so Stapleton, last question. I used to see a horseshoe bats many years ago. I have not seen one for a long time. Are they still present in areas? Yeah, they are still uh, present. Um, there's the greater uh, horseshoe and lesser, I think. The two of them are, are found in certain areas within, within the country. I know in Wales, uh, they've got both species present there. So, yeah, they're they're fortunate enough to, to actually have them. Um, yeah. yeah. Yeah, good. Um, like habitat, uh, habitat loss has probably uh, caused a reduction in numbers. Um, other things that would cause reduction would be uh, things like cats. Cats like to bring presents home, and sometimes it will be a bat. Um, street lighting, uh, wind farms, and, um, yeah, the... And, and roads, they all have a have a, an impact on the the bat population numbers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I just I was just looking at some of the chat section. Uh, Olivia done a, made a good comment about again just supporting kind of what you said. But yeah, there are county bat groups, and you can buddy with someone experienced, build up your hours, you know, and experience until your trainer deems you competent. So. Um, so yeah, if anybody's interested in, in doing that, that would be, and it'd be great for you to let BBCA know, you know, if you're, especially you're a BBCA member, if we know somebody that, you know, is qualified to do surveys, then yeah, it's something we can, we can utilise in the industry. So yeah, keep, keep talking about it. Um, I, I remember from your the presentation, you had, uh, there was an image there of the bat droppings underneath the, in the, in the attic. That was a big pile of bat poo. Like, how long would that take to accumulate like that? It depends on the size of the actual roost. So if there's quite a number of bats in there, then it, it, you can get a quite a large accumulation quite quick. I mean, if they're eating three three thousand insects a night, that's a that's a lot of droppings. So yeah, that is a, that is a lot of droppings. Um, uh, again, I'm just keeping that on the ice uh, chat section just to see if there are a couple of questions in there. Um, Barbara says, is it also important to keep fly roots and replacing trees, for example? Right. I don't know the word, I'm strong in the wording, but yeah, the fly, we've got to make sure we keep those clear and free. And Yes, yeah, that, that is important. So whenever they're doing any sort of uh, planning to um, maybe erect a wind farm or something like that, then they would ha do ecological studies to ascertain where the, the flight routes are for bats um, so that they don't interfere with that. Yeah, 100%. And if we are um, 
taking trees down, then we should be replanting with similar species because um, pine forests and things like that tend to be devoid of um, most life because they're so densely packed and it's not the right kind of habitat for, for bats to actually find that, that niche to nest in. Yeah. Right. Um, we've got a couple more questions popping in. This is good. This is good. Um, uh, so, Christopher, John, we had an issue with a water tank and a loft where bats were um, dedicating into the, I think defecating, defecating. Yeah. yeah, in there. Yeah. And also signs of rodents in the loft. Do we need to wait for the bat people before clearing the water tank? Um, I would get them initially to come and do a survey of the of the loft um, to see what species is present uh, and to ensure that any sort of um, any work that you're going to do isn't going to disturb the bat roost. Um, it may be that it's a temporary roost. It could be a summer one and they may go elsewhere in the winter um, and then get the advice, drain it and then get it chlorinated. Yeah, if it's still in use, I don't think uh, most most homes now, uh, a lot of them up in Scotland, the, the water tanks are devoid now. They don't they don't use them. So. Yeah. Yeah, I do remember the days of water tanks going up in my parents' attic and, you know, I'm splashing, not say splashing around, I'm getting in there. But I don't know, yeah, water tanks is a weird thing now to, I think most places have their combi boilers, don't they? Yeah. Um, uh, I mean, on that disturbance note, Robert uh, asks here, what constitutes as disturbance? You know, if you're in an attic treating for rodents, you know, you may find bat droppings, but actually they're not active. But yeah, what 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 constitutes as disturbance? I think if you go up there and you disturb the roost and um, you're continuously going up there and, and causing um, them to be uh, d disturbed and provoking them to maybe leave the building, then that would be described. That would be classed as disturbance. Yeah. yeah. I've actually, we got, um, uh, we had done an article, I think it was a fair few years ago. I want to say 2019. It might not have been quite that long ago, but the Bat Conservation done a joint article with us in our magazine about, you know, pest control in attics when there are possibly bats present and what you can do what you can't do what you shouldn't do etc so i'll um when i pop off in a minute from the break um i'll try and find the link to that article and i'll put it in the chat section for people to have a little read of but yeah it sort of tells you a bit about what you what you can and can't do when you've got a rodent problem because there are things you can still you know you've got to deal with the rodents at the end of the day it's a public health risk um and you need to get rid of them but it's just knowing yeah the bits bits to do so yeah i'll share that in the chat Thank section you open traps, uh, glue boards, open trays of bait is a no-no. Um, put any bait that you're putting up there in bait stations so that you can't come into contact with it. They're not going to consume it, but they may pick some of the residues up on the on the fur. So yeah, just making it so that the, the bats aren't going to come into contact with what you're doing. And basically not spending a lot of time up there baiting around about maybe the, the hatch area and then going back you know, and, and replenishing the bait without causing too much disturbance to what's up there. Yeah. Well, actually, that article, John Horsley, has just been very helpful to me. Thank you, John, uh, and our training department. He's put the link for that news um, or magazine article in the chat section. So, yeah, anybody wants to have a read of that, it's there for your pleasure. Thank you for that, it's, John. A good, it's a good article. Yeah, I have read it myself many years ago. Yeah. Oh, great. Yeah, so it saves me a job as well. It gives me an extra five minutes for uh, a snack. So, yeah, appreciate that. Um, but listen, um, John, we're, we're right perfectly on time. Really, really appreciate that. So, again, loads of questions. Like, we've got a fabulous audience today, but also fabulous talk. So um, thank you. Uh, thank you for being with us. No problem. Thank you. Thanks Great. very much, everybody. Thanks, bye -bye. John. Bye-bye.